Thank you very much to be there. So uh, I'm Francois Musard. I'm an uh, architect and B manager here at uh, Enya Architect uh, Architecture Company. Uh, so we will start with a short presentation uh, of our uh, Agile Beam uh, community uh, with Sebastian and a short presentation of uh, our sponsor, uh, that is uh, Bricks uh, application, uh, web app. And uh, after, uh, Edward Murphy we will make a presentation uh, for us about uh, how using a Scrum methodology uh, for uh, our for uh, architectural project. So if you you can if you want to ask question, you can uh, use the comment or raise your hand with the special tool for that. Uh, could be useful because we we are a lot of people tonight. Uh, but uh, after, you can open your mic uh, if you want. So the idea is to have a, an open conversation about uh, all this uh, aspect of uh, Agile approach. So, Sebastian, you start with the Agile Beam uh, community yes. presentation. Yes, yes. So thank you very much uh, to be here. Uh, so I will first present about what is Agile Beam. So we, we had the idea of uh, Agile Beam uh, since uh, one year, I think, something like this, uh, because uh, we, we were working on the Bricks app project. So Bricks app it, uh, is a web app to, uh, to collaborate with agility in the domain of uh, architecture and construction. And uh, for the occasion, we met a lot of people. Uh, we interviewed many people that was uh, that were interested in uh, in the domain. So uh, at the beginning, we, we thought uh, Agile uh, is not very famous in construction. But uh, as we see tonight, uh, it, it seems to, to be more and more popular. And uh, and this way, we, we imagine uh, to, to create uh, or to uh, stimulate uh, a community to, to make all these, uh, these people uh, meet together. So at the beginning, we uh, we started uh, by uh, uh, so I will share my screen just to demo the the website. Mm. I think I am sharing now. Uh, so we uh, we created a, a website and we started to to do some uh, some meetups. Uh, so at the beginning, more uh, physical meetups uh, be before the COVID. So for example, here it was uh, in the office of uh, Valor d'Epistre, uh, a quite big uh, French uh, architecture company, but mostly in Paris and mostly in French. So uh, with the COVID, uh, it changed a bit the, uh, the thing because we, uh, we needed to move online. And it was a good occasion, I think, to internationalize a bit also, because uh, of course, the French is a limit for many people. Uh, so we we started uh, to to do some meetup like uh, this of tonight um, and every month. So more uh, often than uh, than before. So you can have all uh, all information about uh, how to to join the community here. Uh, maybe uh, Bilal could share on uh, on the chat also. Uh, so we have a Slack. We have a YouTube channel. So on the YouTube channel, you will uh, you will find uh, uh, the um, the previous meetup. Uh, we will uh, put this one also uh, at the end, and uh, so you can uh, replay it or, or share it to, to your colleagues. Uh, what else? We have uh, we have a group on, on LinkedIn, and we have this wiki. So the the idea of this site is uh, to uh, is to put some information about uh, agility in the domain of construction. So it is in French and in English. You can contribute to it uh, if you want. Uh, we will explain you how to do it. If you you sign into the Slack, uh, we can discuss about that. And uh, what we are looking especially is uh, some uh, some use case about practical use of uh, agile in the domain of construction. So um, uh, there is a section uh, for that. So if you you are interested in uh, writing something about that, it's uh, it's very welcome. Uh, we are also we have also a rubric on uh, on uh, what we call agile recipe, uh, so uh, agile toolbox. Uh, yeah, the idea is to uh, to explain uh, meta methodology per methodology uh, what can be done, but with a very uh, a focus, of course, with the domain of construction, so that people uh, don't feel uh, lost or over over overwhelmed. Sorry, uh, because we think that uh, the domain of construction so is uh, for now. Many people don't know about Agile, or they know about Agile, but uh, as a buzzword, or you need to be Agile, or something like this, no more than that. 
And uh, so I think it's uh, necessary uh, to, uh, to introduce uh, the topic uh, step by step. And why not uh, by, uh, by using a small recipe? I take the, an example of the stand-up meeting. So sorry, the, the, um, the page is more detailed in, uh, in French. But uh, the stand-up meeting is a methodology that uh, you probably know you share every morning and you discuss what you did uh, last day, what you, you do the, the next day, and so on. And uh, it's really a practice that is used in many agile uh, methods like Scrum or Kanban. And uh, it could really change uh, the quality of collaboration, even if you don't do uh, any of the other recipes. So we think we can really uh, work like that. And if you want to present to the next meetup, you can also share a proposal on, uh, on the Slack, and it will be uh, we will be happy to uh, to uh, to host you uh, if it uh, fits the thematic. And that's it. Uh, so you can join uh, you can join our different channel. So now I will switch to to Bricks. So Bricks is uh, at the beginning why we created Bricks, and so I share maybe the, the home page. Uh, because uh, we we were uh, François and me uh, and then Bilal that uh, that uh, join us later, uh, we uh, we are all architect uh, and uh, for François be manager also, and we uh, experience uh, all the day uh, the lack of co collaboration in the domain of architecture, and the consequences on uh, on the the project. Uh, it means the project are, have some quality problem. They are often too expensive. And uh, yeah, you you know you know that more more than me, but uh, it, it is uh, worth to to repeat it. And but but for that there is many reasons. It's a domain with uh, a bit traditional that uh, that is moving slowly. Uh, it's uh, when you we talk about an architecture project, we talk about several companies, uh, small companies that have a very different culture. If you take the the construction company or the architect or the engineer. It's a very uh, different culture, and uh, it's not the same uh, structure. When when you compare with industry, for example, industry it's uh, one uh, one house, and inside you have some engineer, you have some designer, and uh, this unity help to uh, to to have uh, coll more collaboration, but not always. <laughs> so uh, so we decided to create a, a new collaboration application. So I, I think you you know many of them. Uh, pro Around the beam, uh, around beam, because we think that beam is uh, is a bit uh, the occasion for the industry to move and uh, to to evaluate. But we, we also think that beam is not enough, and that uh, it is very important to have a methodology so that uh, we don't end up with uh, just listing the issue and uh, leaving everybody. Uh, Doing the job uh, we, uh, in any order, uh, we think we need to uh, to be uh, a coach for uh, for uh, for the people. So I will uh, dive a bit more in the concrete. So here it's a, it's a, um, a public project. So maybe uh, we will share you. Uh, if Bilal can share it, or I, I can share it after. Uh, so you can uh, you can see it without being connected. You you can also connect. Uh, you can create an account. It's free up to two uh, to three users. Uh, so you can really experience the app entirely uh, inside uh, for you or your your colleagues. And uh, when you start a project, you you start to define a bit uh, with who you are going to to work. So you you can define some teams. So teams is a way to to share the privacy of what you are telling. So for example, if you invite the client, you you don't want that the client see all your exchanges. But it could be also a way to split the, the thematic. If you, for example, you are working on uh, I don't know uh, on very specific construction uh, details, maybe you want to to put together all the topics that uh, talk about that. After you can also uh, go to roadmap view. So roadmap view is like um, it's like a Gantt chart, but a bit more simplified, uh, where you can uh, create your your stage. So you you are I suppose you are all familiar with the stage we have in construction. So here I, I took the Riba stage. Uh, so in in UK you are very good at uh, standardizing this stuff. Uh, and but we think that the stage in construction are too big. Uh, they are two or three months, and uh, often is uh, with agile method we learn that uh, it's good to to iterate to to do some uh, some shorter uh, period of work. So uh, so we we introduce the concept of sprint. So here you can create some sprint, and uh, sprint what it is for for the people uh, for those that don't know 
it's uh, just a way to uh, define uh, what you are going uh, to work on for a specific period, so for one month, uh, two months. So we will see this later in the presentation. Uh, and uh, this forces us to archive and to evaluate if uh, we are we are we practically can do the work or if it's too much, because we all know that in architecture we often have uh, we are all uh, I don't know how we say in English but in uh, in French we we say charrette or design charrette I think it's uh, it's a word that exists also. Uh, so in order not to be in charrette, uh, Spring could be a really good tool. And after, when you when you define what you will do, you just uh, start the sprint. So this one is started, and, and then you track the progress. So to track it, you have uh, a tool that uh, is um, is recommended in uh, Kanban methodology, in uh, Scrum, and in many methods that you you can have uh, on your board uh, in your office if you want. But so with the COVID and re remote working, of course, it's uh, also useful to have it online. And uh, as I, as you see, uh, the, the Kanban, it could be customized. Here we have a uh, four step, but uh, in another team, uh, if I work for the client, for example, I can add a specific uh, task, st specific step uh, for the client uh, validation. Uh, and that's it. Basically, that's it. Where, when you're on a topic, you can uh, you can add some extra information, like, like some task, specific task that you. It's needed to perform in order to end the task, the topic, sorry. Uh, you can add uh, some uh, assignation to, to people and you can discuss. Uh, you can share some file and uh, currently we can only share some file from your desktop, but uh, very soon we will uh, introduce the Revit plugin. So the Revit plugin will allow you to share some uh, screenshot of the model and some uh, record also the view of the model. So I end uh, quickly with uh, the, the BIM integration. Uh, so currently, we have two ways of integrating with BIM uh, app. The first way is a BCF import, so you can find it here and here. Uh, you can import some BCF file. So for those uh, that who don't know, BCF is uh, a standard format of OpenBIM. So there is EFC for the geometry and BCF for the issue and the, the task management. So with BCF, you can import some file from Solibri, from uh, Navisworks, from uh, many uh, apps that uh, follow this uh, this standard and this way you can uh, you can uh, for example do some um, some beam coordination uh, meeting uh, export uh, all the BC with the bcf all the clashes that you you had and then uh, manage them in sprint uh, thanks to bricks and after you can of course uh, do some export in pdf in excel and uh, later in more format this is the first way, and the second way is the BIM plugin. So we will uh, release it in uh, probably in two weeks or a bit more. But uh, if you want to have it uh, sooner as possible, you can uh, you can join uh, our beta program. We have a program. Uh, if you want to test a bit in advance, uh, give you give us uh, your feedback. It will be uh, we will be pleased to to welcome you to this program. So now I I, I stop here because we have a, a long presentation. So thank you very much. Uh, if you want to have more detail, uh, I will share uh, a link to uh, to meet us personally. Uh, we can make a custom demo for your needs. And now I, I leave the, the speak to, to our invitee. Thank you very much. OK, thank you, uh, Sebastian. So uh, now, uh, Edouard, uh, you, you can share your, your screen. OK, Francois, can you release? Control. Uh, no, I, I don't have you. You can share your screen. Uh, we can share together. All right. Okay. I can see. So, I can see. Can you can you all see that? Uh, not for now. Okay. It's on oh, no, on this way. Okay. Okay. It's okay. Yeah. Okay. Okay. Well, thank, thanks, Balil. Uh, hope, hopefully, everybody can hear me. Um, thanks, Balil, Francois, and Sebastian. I really appreciate the invitation to come and talk to you uh, at Agile BIM uh, this evening. Um, it's been a, a, a fantastic opportunity, I think, for everybody to just try and understand what we in the Agile uh, built environment have been doing. And uh, I've got a little, maybe a little case study that uh, will take you through 
uh, the uh, a fairly a, a really a fairly small project that we did uh, in the middle of last year. So, what's agile? Uh, agile is probably uh, an adjective to to most people, um, but if you look in the Oxford English Dictionary, uh, you'll probably find that there's another definition that's been put there uh, of late. Uh, probably popped up about the year 2000, which relates to or denoting a method of project management. So it's agile project management that we're going to have a little talk through tonight. So you're probably wondering where agile methods started. Uh, well, it started with these two guys, uh, Jeff Sutherland and Ken Schwaber, uh, who actually invented what they called Scrum. And Scrum was a, a way of uh, doing projects that involved teams. And because it involved teams, and they've sort of referred back to rugby parlance, um, they called their methodology Scrum. Uh, but it wasn't until they actually did a fairly significant project after the 9-11 disaster, believe it or not, uh, the FBI wanted, to, well, FBI realized that they'd kind of um, messed up in their knowledge management systems and needed new data processing systems to solve that. And they called in Jeff and Ken to, to actually solve that particular problem, which they actually did in the end. But the FBI called uh, uh, Jeff and Ken's uh, methodology an agile methodology, and that's kind of what gave rise to it being called a methodology. So all of that being the case, um, but I suppose agile has been used predominantly in the tech sector. Um, but it can be used on uh, any sector for any type of project anywhere. Um, the type of project, big or small, doesn't really matter. And so the fact that I'm going to present to you a small project uh, is of little consequence ultimately because um, effectively uh, you can use it on any size of project. Now, I wanted to use it at the very beginning at the client brief to see whether we could actually uh, use it uh, at the beginning, uh, mainly because I felt that's kind of where most of the problems that we have in the built environment, certainly through design and through construction, um, if we actually re-examine, going back, and I do a lot of post-occupancy evaluation, if we go back over those projects that I've always gone back to, ultimately I can always find that the problem started somewhere with the client brief. So I think for, from that perspective, um, it's, I suppose most clients, um, if you actually ask them uh, about their building and how influential their building is in uh, guiding the profitability or otherwise of their business, uh, they probably wouldn't actually uh, give it much, much regard. But the, the fact of the matter is, that buildings are massively important to not just the productivity of their people, but actually the profitability of the building, or sorry, of the business itself. Uh, a building can be and is actually part of what you know, most business managers would call their growth stack. That's that, that's that set of tools and knowledge bases that goes to create the new projects, uh, new products, improve existing ones, help them to market, help them to sell, and help them to communicate. But like I say, most clients don't actually give their buildings uh, that much um, regard. So what we, what we in our profession, I think, really need to do is to actually just to, to really try to encourage clients to look a little bit more deeply at what a, what a building can actually do for them and how if they actually put a little bit more effort into it, it would actually pay literally dividends uh, in the end in the end result. So a lot of you will be new to Scrum and will probably won't have happened or uh, come across it before. Uh, you're new to Scrum, new to Agile. The the terms are kind of um, you you can kind of well I suppose Scrum is a subset of Agile methods. There are other methodologies that are similar to Scrum, and they're all kind of lumped under the under this sort of Agile methods banner. Uh, but you know in in essence the terms are are interchangeable. Uh, but what's the what's at the heart the beating heart of it all? 
is that um, Scrum actually starts to work with customers, uh, uses customers to benchmark quality and desirability. Uh, so we're actually always looking at the outcome of the project and we start with the customer and work back to the building. We don't start with the building and then work out to the customer. So it's, it's actually a way of, of, uh, of effectively working backwards. So in order to do that, um, most, most projects um, that we do now would actually start with an idea for the project. Uh, we'd scope out that idea, then build it, then hand it over or launch, and then the, the customer would actually take possession of the building 18 months, two years down the line when we finished it, not really knowing what he was going to get when he was at position number one. Uh, at the very beginning of the project, and I don't, and I dare say, even you know, architects, designers, contractors, we all start out with an idea of what we think this thing was going to look like when we finish it, but we're never really sure. And the people who, uh, I suppose, get the impact of everything that we do is the poor old user at the end at the end of it. So what Scrum does is it kind of helps us to uh, maybe target a little bit more what we're going to do over the project uh, by introducing the, this, the kind of concept that we could maybe build a mock-up of our building uh, and have the users test that mock-up uh, so that we're all of the ideas, uh, the scopes, the concepts, that we could test them early doors with the users uh, as a means to firm up exactly what we're going to build. So in that way, we don't build you know, with uncertainty or risk or extra ex uh, expense that we build what's actually needed and what the client needs and, uh, and, and we know that because we've already tested that concept. So the idea of doing that in a building has probably until now uh, not been something that's been very easy to do uh, but now that we've actually got uh, you know, I suppose BIM and other methodologies, particularly VR, which is where we what we're going to use. Uh, then we have now got the the ability to actually test in immersive quality what we actually do um, with our with our buildings. So um, moving on to sort of the agile methodology, which is kind of um, you know if we're going to operate an agile process and change change this from a linear process to an agile process then we have to have a slightly different mindset and that mindset was um, effectively I, I suppose pulled together into what's now term terminal terminals the sort of um, the agile methodology I stopped stuttering over my words so what agile methodology um, effectively um, I suppose it turns the microscope upside down so that instead of us you know, being really concerned about technical issues and making sure that all of our technical details are correct, what uh, Agile says, well, okay, all of that's great, but why not put users' concerns at the front and center of what our concerns absolutely are? Um, when it comes to the work itself, um, it's not actually what we design that's important. It's what's actually built, and so it's what's actually how things work uh, is much more important to us than how things can be designed. Um, most of us in the construction industry will will know that most of our problems come when we have handovers from one piece of work to another piece of work, where the architect hands over to the building services or the structural engineer. Um, these interfaces are the things that. Um, we kind of try to avoid if we possibly can. Uh, what uh, Agile is saying is, let's just accept that those interfaces are always going to be there. And if we're working in favor of the client, let's just make that extra effort to manage those interfaces, to, to invite them in, but manage them. And then that sort of uh, slides through to the last concept, which is this idea that we need to try to avoid change. Uh, so what? So once we get so far, if we get to Reba stage three, four, five, you know, onwards. That after that, change gets expensive. Well, change is less expensive to deal with if you invite it into the early parts of the project. So if we've got in a situation whereby we've actually got the client using the building and finding the problems with it before we even build it, 
then we're in a situation where we can deal with those changes early so that when we do build it, there shouldn't be any changes. So that's this is where the Agile methodology, and this these guys, 17 of them, uh, met together in Utah uh, sometime around 2001 and developed the Agile methodology. And it's, it has been the backbone uh, pretty much of most of the tech industry in the last um, uh, 25 years or so. So, Excuse me, Edward, just, this is your interpretation of the Agile Manifesto or...? Yes, this is, this is kind. Of, this this is this is kind of um, you know the, these are the principles that uh, the Agile Manifesto. You know, if you kind of go on the website and look on the website, just Google Google Agile Manifesto, you'll come up with uh, the Agile Manifesto, which is published by these guys. And these these are the four principles that they ask you to abide. So whilst we're designing whilst we're designing or operating our project, uh, these are the principles that we need to be. Um, because I, I like most your, mindful of. I, I like your interpretation because it's more uh, it's more um, useful uh, with the design process. In the, in the website, it's more for uh, for uh, computers. Uh -huh. for I, I, yeah, I probably I've probably tweaked it. You know, a little yeah, yeah, bit, but, uh, but the asset, the essence will be the same. Okay, okay so. Um, The, the so the the, um, the methodology itself um, we we followed a pretty much a, a traditional agile uh, anatomy of an agile methodology and so those of you who are not ex uh, experienced of agile some of you will, will already recognize this if you've already seen agile and used agile um, but we start with step one with the user stories uh, we're, we're operating this uh, to build a brief, but we're building that brief through what we call here the Royal Institute of British Architects Stage Zero, uh, which is called Strategic Definition. So this is the area where the client is meant to pull his brief together, his or her brief together. Uh, Reba Stage 1 and 2 are the effectively concept design stages. So we're, op we're, we're operating an agile methodology across that brief building uh, step, but also partially into the concept design. So uh, user stories is the place where everybody in the client organization from absolute top to absolute bottom uh, gets involved. So we're not just talking to the, the C-suite, you know, or the project manager, or middle management, where we want to get to everybody. We want to get to the heart of the user. So. Um, we invite them to a charrette, uh, which is the word that sort of we're, we're using. Um, we get we get a big day, and we we get everybody in, and we we go through a traditional user stories process. Uh, from there, we we get uh, all of those user stories, which I'll explain to you in a little bit uh, more detail later. Uh, we get all of those user stories into a backlog, which summarizes the user stories into maybe four or five big ticket project requirements. So effectively, we're breaking what is uh, a morass of information. We're assembling it and, and uh, teasing it out, if you like, um, into strands or streams that then we uh, we call a backlog problem, uh, which we we feel is something that needs to be addressed to help this particular business get a building that is right for them. So once we've actually got the problems, the product backlog. We push those into what we call a scrum. So scrum sessions are traditional, um, effectively very rapid, short uh, design sessions where we get users and designers together to solve those big ticket problems that we've that we've come across. Now we've found traditionally that we can usually uh, amalgamate quite a few of those backlog issues together into the solving of the problems that. Um, uh, that we're kind of doing uh, when we're actually working with users, and I'll show you that a little bit as we go through the case study. But then, once we've got these, once we got the um, the problems solved, and we we develop them up into 3D, we then push them into uh, visual reality uh, VR setting, where users can actually essentially put a headset on and walk through the building that they've just designed or the part of the building or the, the concept, whatever it is that problem is solved. Uh, we can represent it in some, some sort of VO context 
and they will be able to test it. And not only that, but that's, that can actually be shared with the rest of the users. So we'll have a very small group in the Scrum team, mo no more than six or seven, um, including users and designers. Um, but then we can, once we've got the prototype, we can share that right the way across the business usually for them to test it. Once we've got all the feedback back from the prototypes, we can probably, we can go back to Scrum if we think it's really wrong. Um, if we think it's right and it's okay and everybody wants to sign it off, um, well, particularly the product manager, um, the, who is the, the sort of business owner, if you like, if they're happy to sign it off, then we can ship it to what we call um, BIM-enabled uh, design, stage three design. So um, how do we kind of uh, do all of this in, um, uh, we, what we wanted to kind of do was to, to see whether this process would actually work in practice. Would it work on a live project? And so we, we actually applied to Innovate UK, as is the innovation government funder here in the UK. And we, we applied for 60,000 and were successful in getting the 60,000 pounds to actually do a case study on, well, initially we put in for two projects, but in the end, one of our partners, Hippo Digital, wanted us to do it on their office. So we extended, the, we extended it to do uh, their office as well. So we wanted to find out who uh, would users embrace the methodology? Could we develop prototypes quickly enough? Uh, would users be comfortable with VR technology as a prototyping tool? I mean, we didn't need users to be wearing the VR set for extended periods of time. And we have had people with the VR sets on touring buildings for up to 40 minutes at a time. Um, so, and where, where there are, we wanted also to find out if there were any hardware issues. So, as, as a for instance, we, we did find that traditional BIM um, machines are really not good enough to drive VR headsets. You know, it was that kind of stuff that we were, this kind of technical stuff that we were finding in the background. Um, so, the, we, we applied for the audience of the future, which is actually, which targeted at the effectively the uh, entertainment industry rather than the architectural industry but they did allow us as an architectural project to to be because of the nature of what we were doing um to to uh, apply and we were so consequently uh, successful um the team uh, was led by olio um and we had to be we're a micro business you know so we're not uh, not very big at all um certainly wouldn't have had the capability to do what needs to be done uh, across the spectrum with, um, with the project. So we needed some help. Uh, and we needed particular help of a lead designer in DLA. Uh, John Orrell was my lead architect. John's online today. Um, we also had a scrum master, a sort of qualified scrum master, and Richard uh, Powell at Hippo Digital. Um, then we needed some people to look after the technology. We knew that BIM machines weren't going to be good enough, so we needed people who had a little bit better BIM machines, or sorry, a little bit better in terms of VR machines and understand that VR technology a bit better. And that was Playworks. And then I, was, I wanted somebody who actually had experience of designing in VR. And we found... Um, uh, a chap called James Simpson at Copper Candle, and uh, James had all, James had got something like uh, ten years of uh, experience of designing, uh, effectively uh, most most of the productions at the Royal Opera House in Covent Garden. They were they've been designing their stage stage scenery and lighting uh, in VR with actors and directors uh, for over 10 years. So they've kind of got experience of doing this, uh, pretty much already, albeit in a different field. And that was invaluable to us in the end. So with all of that, um, I'll kick into the, uh, the case study itself and just give you a little bit of detail about how all of that, uh, how, oh, I'm, going, sorry, I'm going in the wrong direction now. Hang on. Uh, this is the, the building, um, very small building, like I say, um, Hippo Digital are a, a rapidly growing um, firm of uh, what we call user experience uh, specialists. So they use Scrum and Agile um, with, with their clients who are predominantly the UK government, uh, designing the interfaces between government websites and the general public. 
and also other programs that need to be orientated to public access. Uh, so they help government to, to do all of that. Major client is the National Health Service. And it so happens the health service have an office in Leeds, which is really about 100 yards uh, back, back towards the right. Uh, and to the left, about 50 yards to the left or 50 meters to the left, is the, uh, the train station, the city train station in Leeds. And so uh, NHS users usually have to pass this office to get to the train station. And uh, our client was kind of uh, Hippo Digital, we're kind of thinking, uh, maybe they'd like to drop in and have a coffee or something like that. You know, whilst whilst they were leaving work and on the way on the way home, and drop in for a chat. So that was kind of one of the reasons why they actually wanted to procure this building here. Uh, other things they need because they do lots of scrums and things like that. They need to have lots of wall space for workshops and things like that. And they also need to be able to to pull clients into their office um, in order to do those workshops. Um, so, so the, the, the kind of the office is, is, is quite mobile in terms of the numbers of people that who kind of uh, travel in and travel out you know, over time. Um, they've got, Hippo Digital have gone from uh, three staff to, well, I think actually I've just looked on the website today, they're up to 90 staff now. And so they've done that in uh, no more than six years, I think, uh, pretty, pretty much. So they're rapidly growing. Uh, and so the off the office itself is is something that's uh, um, is kind of well needs to be very flexible. This is the inside. Um, when they when they kind of they're they're renting the office. Uh, they've taken two floors of this particular office, so it's um, so quite quite medium size you know, at the moment. But it gives them some scope to expand uh, later. When the, for the interior design, they went out to three interior design. Uh, companies locally to get some quotations in and to ask them as well if they would wouldn't mind doing some sketch designs on the outline brief uh, that they they just um, well that one that I've just given to you they kind of gave to us so it was the same brief that they gave to these three interior design companies so the first one that came back here and um, there's no names involved here but um, um, I mean, it looks it looks um, fantastic, you know, in terms of um, it's got a nice little place there for clients to come in and sit. It's got loads of space for people to do things on on the walls and run workshops, etc. Um, and you know, as far as the the um, the directors at Tipo Digital, they thought this was great and couldn't wait to get on and and do it. So so they commissioned it. Uh, they went along. They got the, the office design. And it kind of pretty much um, the floor sat in this kind of format, whereby uh, the entrance uh, from the staircase, this is the staircase here. I've got this sort of blown up this side. So you come up the stair, come into the entrance, have a coffee here, be taken through into the workshop area at the back. And there's a small admin area in the middle. Um, so they were, they were kind of in, in the space for 18 months. Uh, well, I'd, I kind of uh, asked Richard Powell if he would do the uh, Scrum Master job for us on the uh, Agile of the Future, uh, so Audience of the Future project. And he then mentioned, he said, listen, we're having some really bad problems with our office. It's just not, not working for us. Do you think we could actually do an Agile process uh, on the office? So we kind of, um, we had a little bit of cash in the bank. So, uh, so we thought, yeah, let's go for it. Um, this was the kind of the second proposal, uh, which um, looked great as well, but um, it was pretty much the same kind of thing. So the, the second uh, proposal, interior design, had pr come up with pretty much the same solution, you know, to the first one. Um, but because the first one was probably a little bit more detailed in the, in the level of drawing and work that had been done, they kind of gave it, uh, they gave it to them. So when we came on board to, to actually start the process, uh, we started on the 19th of May in uh, 2019, uh, so just over a year ago, we're coming up to two years, um, and we finished on the 4th of July, so a very short, sharp uh, process. And, and I would say that, you know, no matter what the size, uh, we'd be, we would be thinking that we would need to do it, you know, we would always be aiming to do it in a similar sort of time. Um, in this particular instance, you'll see here, we've got a step zero, which is an 
which was what we kind of, all our ideas. So this is something that I came across um, before I started, you know, uh, and before I founded a company, I came across this, this way of generating uh, user surveys where the users actually generate the survey as well as provide the answers. So you can kind of, uh, it, it's, um, it's been developed um, by, in, by Princeton in conjunction uh, with Google, and it uses the Google algorithm, uh, the same that, that you use when you're using on your search engine to prioritize uh, the answers or that, you know, so you give it a search and it will prioritize based on the number of people who've actually um, I suppose found, found that particular answer useful. So in this particular case, we asked the question, uh, if there was one thing you could change to improve your office, working environment, what would that be? Now, Hippo Digital, Hippo Digital had some dogs uh, in the office. And so I've, I sort of um, sort of mischievously put, you know, when we seeded this first question, put no dogs. And the second uh, suggestion was just better selection of coffee. Well, nothing to do with the building, but maybe two things that would help people feel that the office was a better place to have some dogs around or maybe some better coffee. And they had to decide which one was best. And then they would answer that. And then there were other seeded questions. And after a while, if they felt that none of the seeded answers uh, suited what they actually were thinking themselves, they could have press the I can't decide button and put their own answer in this little box, you know, down here. And then that answer would actually go in as a seeded question. So if they, if they said um, faster PC, then up here would be faster PC and better selection of coffee to get to get voted on. So and in the end, and I'm, I apologize, I've kind of faded this out a little bit because so, I wanted to just kind of see it. But what you actually get is you get a list of things that users have selected and the rating of how users have actually voted. So you can see what are the most important things to them. And so you can see from here, I've just picked out the ones that the five top things, but we can go right the way down to 20. We had, well, I think we went to something like 60 kind of things that were mentioned in, in, the, in the, the survey came out. Um, yeah, Rod, the, the sound yeah. is very good because I think your mic is... All oh, right, sorry. Okay, I'll just uh, fix that. It did slip a little bit. So the, is that better? Yes, thank you. Yeah. So the, um, so the, the, Top five things were uh, booths for phone calls. So they wanted privacy, they wanted confidentiality, they wanted more meetings space, uh, they wanted quiet working space, and they wanted to be able to have power on top of the desk so that they didn't have to get under it to plug their laptops in. So this is a mobile community coming in, wanting to get to work quickly, but needing the office as a place where they can have meetings. And then they would normally work away from the office. Very similar probably to how we feel we're working in a COVID situation now. They, they were working at home mostly, or working from home mostly, um, and then just coming into the office when there were things that they needed to do. But there was a small core of people, and there is a small core of people who are doing administration type jobs, and they're, they're the ones who are there all of the time. So um, once we kind of got that, just a feel using the uh, all our ideas process for what was um, likely to be coming up in the in the charrette, we went into the charrette, uh, the user story charrette, and the first thing we do as exercise one is to find out who's in the room. So to find out in the room, uh, we effectively um, give them a, a just a uh, a little sort of post-it note and ask them who they are what they do and what they think are the most important things uh, that they would, and, um, and what do they expect from the experience of you know, visiting a Hippo digital office? Why do they actually go there? When we kind of did that, um, we got the, um, and I think most organizations would probably fit into, into this, um, what's called the minders, grinders, and finders. So we, we kind of, the minders are the people um, who are, maybe C-suite. So these are the people that we would normally take a brief from. And we would never hear from grinders or finders as architects or engineers, you know, project managers. And uh, we, we usually take our a brief from the minders. But of course, that's always only half the story. Um, in this particular case, um, 
we had uh, remote delivery teams, uh, staff, uh, external staff seconded, uh, products, pro project product owners, uh, UX research, user experience researchers, and we even had some NHS staff. And if you kind of look at this diagram of this particular business, it kind of sums this business up. You can see, actually, if there's a place that the office really needs to or would really be able to um, generate real impact, it would be being able to help those grinders to do their work that little bit better. Uh, and if they were able to do it better, then um, the rest of the office would function a lot better as well. We're always being being mindful. There's always that little there's little boxes at the bottom there of people as well that we also need to just keep in mind uh, when we're thinking about regulation and all of that kind of stuff. So exercise two in the charrette is to um, send out some more little post-it notes and uh, ask people um, thinking about the types of people from exercise one. Uh, so you don't have to be that type of person yourself, but you could represent them if you want and, or represent yourself. What things as a user uh, would you want to be able to do in a re-envisioned Hippo Digital office? and complete as many as you can, so they can complete. So we kind of got 200 uh, odd um, post-it notes back, um, which were all of the type of, as a particular type of person or user, I would like to be able to, in order to. So, so you had a situation, a motivation, and an expected outcome. And this is all completely agile methodology. And when you get the post-it notes back, you kind of get this kind of thing where, um, I mean, a lot of them seem sort of quite, um, you know, I suppose, uh, trivial in some senses, you might say. But nevertheless, they are the kind of things that we as designers hardly ever get to see. These are people who've got real issues with where they're working on a day-to-day -day basis. Um, and these are the kind of things that, uh, that are popping up has been really important to them. So being able to find a desk quick, quickly, being able to store your belongings, uh, not, not to have visitors pass through your admin office areas, and be able to uh, get to the office and participate in those back to base days that they organized you know, every Friday. So this was one category, one theme, one product, one of the product backlogs, if you like, that we felt we needed to solve. And we, we titled it Space and Spaces. Um, the next thing they were really conscious of was confidentiality. Uh, they just felt they, you know, any, pretty much anybody and anybody, everybody could wander through this office at any time, looking at anything they needed to, and it just wasn't being managed in any uh, coherent way whatsoever. So the other thing was they wanted to be able to have confidential meetings. They wanted to be able to have even a formal board meeting without other people listening in on it. Um, they wanted to, to be able to hold uh, meetings with, you know, confidentially with clients and, and even just even to have uh, ad hoc phone calls, you know, um, privately. These are very simple, basic things, but massively important things that almost we would take, to granted, take for granted. But again, as designers, we're not thinking about that. We're thinking about, you know, the RSJ or the, you know, the type of veneer or the material or the door spec or whatever like that, those kind of things. Um, so thirdly, uh, the better information technology. So you kind of get in the, get in the kind of thing. And so the product backlog list looked like this. So space and spaces, desks and furniture, first impression, good technology, health and well-being, uh, plants, daylighting, desks, ergonomics, and ease of access. Um, they wanted to be able to get into the building 24 seven, if they, if, which they weren't able to do uh, at that time. So how, how many items? Uh, well, we, we kind of, there were 250, 250 came back, but we sort of streamed them, streamed them down into those six items. But mm -hmm. there were things that, there were things that were missing that we kind of, as designers, so you've always got to think that, um, you know, okay, users are telling you one story, um, they're communicating, but there's also, as a designer, uh, there's a communication that needs to go back in the opposite direction, things that need to be prompted. So we felt that that office had an acoustic issue. We felt that the external spaces were pretty poor, that it wasn't inviting enough. Uh, we felt car parking was, was pretty poor. Um, 
we did, we were a bit undecided about the dogs issue and whether whether they should be managed a little bit better. There were only two dogs in the office, by the way, not sort of you running hair. But we could see that there'd be some people who would who would not like the idea of uh, dogs in the office and would be a little bit scared of them, maybe. Um, and then there was the whole things about you know disabled access and all of those kind of things. Um, we were also conscious of designs about there needing to be a heart space. That this this was an office that was kind of you know, was spread all over the place and just not not functioning from a community perspective. And there were things that we could do that maybe we could inc incorporate that would enhance the culture. Um, we thought the location of it within the city was a great thing, and they should maximise that to be able to reach out to uh, other spaces, you know, in that particular district of the city. Um, the building itself is an old, you can see part of the building there, it's an old building, lots of character and we felt there's a, there's a charm about it, again, which wasn't being exploited. Um, and then there's this whole thing about the NHS and how could we make more of an opportunity of that. So these were all kind of business opportunity, business centric opportunities that we as architects and designers were thinking, how can we enhance this, this building to make it a better place for business. So, so you mix uh, a brief from the user and uh, some uh, ideas from. Uh, yes. Yes. Absolutely. Your experience. Yes. Okay. So, so ultimately, um, we kind of uh, we went from so we done the user stories. We we got our product backlog, which is that uh, list there on the top right hand side, and now we're into the Scrum teams. And you'll see this is a typical Scrum team. Uh, that's John Oral, who's on call with us today, sitting in the middle of them all, uh, taking them through some of the ideas uh, that we have and um, meshing them with some of the ideas that the users had already uh, told us about. Um, the Scrum team itself, the traditional Scrum team, we had a client project owner. So we had somebody from the client team, exec board, who was there to make sure that what we were doing stayed on track and um, within project limits. Um, so it's that, it's that person's duty to say when they think enough's been done, that we've actually met the brief, or even whether or not we're actually even going to be able to meet the brief. Um, so ultimately, they're, they're the arbitrator of quality, value, and and the and the ones who kind of say, okay, we think this is going to work for us, or you know, or not, as the case may be. Um, we had all the users as customers from all parts of the business, so we had a representation from the top director level, right the way down to user level, uh, the, the bargain basement, if you like, so that we had every part of the of the uh, the problem that we needed to solve represented. Uh, we had Scrum Master, well, Richard um, was there. I was kind of a quasi Scrum Master as well, since I kind of know uh, quite a lot about it. And then, of course, we have our designers. And John was backed up by his own design team who are based in Leeds, you know, as well. Um, so when we kind of got into the nitty gritty of talking about this kind of thing, um, one of the things that um, was we were kind of talking about was this this you know as both users and designers was this business of no sense of arrival no no way to properly check people in and uh, make sure that you know they had a place to sit and wait you know have a coffee and that was just for users and so we could we could manage them and not have them sort of wandering around uh, the second was this issue of compromised uh, confidentiality so this office in the middle uh, was just not work and we had people guests you know traveling by it they might see somebody walk across the office chat with them they'd be looking at all the confidential information that was there other people trying to make confidential calls it wasn't working um, and all of that was really because this collaboration space was at the back of the office away from the door um, so we kind of uh, we were kind of thinking well there's a number of things that we can kind of um, improve well John was kind of thinking of a number of things that they could improve straight away and this is John's sketch um, and very quickly we can kind of see that it got some structure to it so there's a heart space there's a place for the administration people to be which is kind of uh, more towards the back and maybe wrapped around the side uh, then they would have views to the river uh, locally 
and also the sun came around that end of the building as well so the people who were there most of the time would actually have more of the external amenity of the building as well as a little bit more control over who was using the building then the center space would be touchdown space and the outside would be meetings and so in the end that was all kind of agreed as uh, something that they'd like to see developed and we, we finished the scrum meeting went away for a couple of days and then came back to the next scrum meeting and literally this is kind of transformation in two or three days work to actually get to this level of detail and you can kind of see here now we've got we've got a structure so we actually have um if i can get my point to go on meet and greet space and then we've got we actually got two flows so we've got a guest flow down the left hand side and the staff flow down the right hand side so we're segregating those flows you know instantaneously so we've got meeting spaces in on the left hand side and then a drop-in space uh, for touchdown space in on the right hand side and so that can be used by guests as well as um, uh, staff hippo digital staff it can also be used for returning um, researcher staff who can come in and just drop down and you know, there's a whole row of um, these touchdown spaces at this end here we also have coffee and and uh, kitchen uh, locally here and uh, then admin space is at the back here where they're kind of secluded they've got the access out to the river and the sunshine but there's also a, a dual space here which can be admin but also transferred into workshop space as well so if they want to have workshops internally or even invite clients in, but at least it's managed over a shorter period of time. So all of that uh, begins now to seem like it's something that could work. Um, does it, but that's kind of just us saying that. Um, the confidential area was on the other side of the staircase. So again, that can be workshop area or confidential area, it becomes multi-purpose. And so we're maximizing the floor space. So, so the kind of thing here is um, is whether all of that works. Um, and I, we kind of, so we kind of need to put all of that into virtual reality. And I've I kind of just picked out three very short videos. One of them's a minute. The others are kind of a little bit less than that. Um, I'm going to let them play. But what I want you to kind of take on board is just how much um, detail is actually coming back from these people who are actually walking through the office, the kind of detail that we would just only dream of, um, and the kind of detail that we didn't, we didn't get actually when we showed them the 3D uh, visualizations, they literally had to be in the immersive space in order to give us this detail. I'll just let it go. I can start it again. So I think I think you can see there she's really comfortable in the space, really comfortable with the headset, and really engaged in what it is that she's seeing. And already we're starting to see here that these these people are effectively getting ownership over this product that is about to be delivered delivered to them. Um, next chap, uh, just to, let me see if I can get that one down. This guy was really comfortable uh, in the space. 
and was managed managed to get through the VO uh, and just wandering around, not needing any help. Yeah, just going for it. Obviously, a bit of a gamer. <laughs> so it's uh, so we did find the younger ones. How many times to make all this uh, workshop? Sorry, ask that question again. How how many times to make to all this workshop? Uh, we just held it. We just held the workshop. Uh, well, I, I guess we, we but it's, we probably had uh, over the Scrum sessions. We probably did those over three workshops. So this this one here is the second one. And so we went away, made the modifications that they talked about in this, came back, and then did this did this did this again effectively, and uh, with the modified. Um, you know, from the from the more detailed feedback, and we're, I mean the kind of feedback that you were getting was 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 volumetric, you know, and it's um, we can we can do without this space with a bit more space here. This would actually work a little bit better if it was this way, you know, those kind of things. They're all the kind of things that when we do buildings traditionally and people move in first and they say great building, but it could have been a bit better if. Well, we're we're catching all of that. It could have been a bit better if straight away before we've even built. You know, so it's um, and we're using the agile methodology. I mean, I would say as well that VR of itself. I mean, most architects have, have access to VR, but it's VR combined with the agile methodology that actually is what they drive. It, that's what they, they, the the uh, the zeitgeist of this actually is. If you use VR on its own, you're not going to get this. You need to you need to understand what you're doing why you're doing it. There needs to be purpose behind the process. And to, to have a process that is uh, effectively followed, you know, step by step to get to these kind of outcomes is really important. Yeah. So um, prepare some questions, some specific question to ask to all the user. You have to prepare a lot. Yes, it's, it's, just not, it's not just for fun to, to move in the project in 3D. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Um, I included this last um, video because um, ra rather um, sort of crystal ball glazing uh, at the time. We did this in 2019. Um, but the, the chap who's sitting down, Scott from Playworks, um, he kind of suggests to the chap who's got the headset on um, whether if he, had, if he had VR at home, he wouldn't need to come into the office. And funny, funnily enough, we've kind of been thinking as to whether or not we could actually move our offices online now that we actually have the COVID situation. So I'll just, you know, it's a, it's a little bit garbled, as a, but you might be able to pick out, uh, what do you see if I can get it? I've lost my speed. Oh, there we go. In terms of cost, comparatively to a classic uh, design route, what would be the difference? Just say, say that again, sorry. I was asking in terms of cost, uh, what would be the, the average difference uh, with a um, traditional uh, design route? Yeah, I mean, that's, we, well, I mean, we kind of were, we're, we're kind of, we, we got 60,000 pounds and we managed to do three projects straight through from stage zero to, well, you might say the middle of stage two, um, you know, cer certainly well, to well towards the, the middle of stage two. So an architect would, I would expect he'd be paying 15% of the construction cost to get to, to that kind of level. Well, f fairly close to it. I mean, there's a few architects here, maybe they'd be able to say a bit more. Um, but I, I would say we're, with this, pro with this process, uh, we're not adding much more than uh, half a perc half a percent of the construction cost uh, onto the project. So if a if a if an architect charges, you know, well, if the design team design team fees are twelve percent of a project cost, we're we're adding about another half to three quarters of a percent on to get to that. And I will promise you that all of that and more will come back through what is saved through the project as it goes through its lifetime. And when you get to site and you've got a project that you know is right, that you know is, is absolutely on message, that you're actually doing maybe 80% of what would actually need to be done on, under a, I mean, Ken, Ken and Ken's kind of written a book, you know, how to do uh, twice the work and half the time. 
you know so and that that's the kind of because of because of the savings that uh, agile methods are making through the process all of that and more would come back yeah so and it's not so it's not massively more expensive i think is the, is the result is the in answer. terms of schedule and or timeline is it a, a similar timeline to a traditional project yeah well like i say we we did three projects um we started in november and we were finished all of the projects uh in july um so each project got something like about two months but there was a there was a lot of delay yeah. um in in those in those two months just one of the biggest one of the biggest problems you know if there is a problem with agile is making sure that you can get all of the people you need in the room at the right yeah. time and so in order for that to happen then you need a long leading period so you need people's diaries to be clear so so we we do the we can do it in you know we can do what we do in maybe four weeks but we probably need to leave people three or four weeks lead in time before we so we just make sure we get everybody in the in the room at the same time okay thanks so um i'm coming to the close now i hope i'm not running too much over time um one of the things that we're kind of uh, interested in, in is to obviously to try and get this used more universally in the uk and so we're kind of conscious of what's happening with the um, transformation construction agenda uh, here in the UK which has been led by the construction innovation hub and the CDBB uh, they're currently piloting a new version of government soft landings and uh, which they're actually um, looking to come up with enhanced brief and preparation um, strategies uh, in order to be able to to run a better government soft landings processes fully realizing that if you get the brief right um then the rest of the project you know is much easier to, to to go right i would also say as well that if you get the brief right and document it properly then the process at the end of uh, post occupancy evaluation which is kind of what we do a lot of um that's because well, i'm doing post occupancy evaluation against project briefs that i just totally inconsistent so I'm, I'm evaluating something on the basis of not really understanding well the client's not really understanding what he wanted himself in the first instance and we're asking for an evaluation of it you know if we can actually get briefs that are you know 3d virtual reality electronic briefs that are properly documented and do a post evaluation at the end to say uh, whether or not this building is the same or different to what was envisaged at the beginning then we're in a situation where maybe post occupancy evaluations will be valued a little bit more highly than they are now but ultimately what we'd like to do is be able to to connect these two ends of projects together so that we get a proper brief that's an electronic brief that's uh, been developed in an agile way and there's nothing as well to say that you can't actually run the rest of the project in an agile way as well there are people online here who are running uh, construction uh, projects in agile and advising how to do construction in agile ways and use intact and uh, last planner as a, as methodologies as well which are very similar to agile methodologies in order to get you know the agile agile thinking into the whole of the construction process as well so this is where the, the thinking goes from from beginning to end and into into the start and I'm realizing I'm a little bit out of time, now, so I'm going to just keep pushing on. Um, here in the Agile, in COVID, Agile obviously has got interest because we are in a situation where we can align people, process, and place. People working from home, not wanting to go to the office. How do we square all of that? This is perfect for sorting all of that out and uh, getting people to understand. And just to give you a, 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 a flavor for what we managed to do in this uh, small office in three three four weeks uh, i'll just let this i'll let this run and so you're actually seeing here um what's what the client what's important to the client there's no technical information here there's no lighting there's no you know um, sizing there's no structures this is everything that's important to the client um and so it's everything that's important um that we have a methodology that we can tease all of this out uh, so that the client actually gets you know what's uh, what's important and and ultimately then that we can build it you know, without 
you know, really ri risk of, of or fear that what we're doing is the wrong thing. So we're, we're mapping out effectively what is uh, the right thing to build before we actually map out the right way to build it. So in the, here you see the meeting rooms to the left, this, this touchdown space. Uh, so this is your, your client guest uh, corridor, if you like. And now we're moving over to the kind of the more um, staff side of things where, you know, there's touchdown spaces. And then we're moving into the admin space. Um, and there's a, a relic that's called the photocopier just there. Um, there's the, the um, workspace at the back with the, with the, uh, the wall. Uh, the writable wall, uh, which can be uh, transferred between being admin space or being work workshop space, so it's flexible and flexible for the future as well, uh, as far as that's concerned. Um, and and so the, the the users were able to put a headset on and just walk through this in much the same way that we're walking through it now and comment on it and just make sure that it's right for those. And so when they walk in, when they walk into it and get in this particular uh, space. Um, then they will they will already recognize it they know why why it is like it is and they will achieve they will achieve a certain level of ownership over it and because they own it they appreciate the business more um, they work more they are happier hopefully they'll be more productive as a result of, of all of that um, so if you want to have a look at it I'll take some quick questions um, anybody who's got a phone with a QR code on it and if you've got a phone that you can actually slip in a headset um, which, uh, with uh, augmented reality or a viewer, uh, then you can just uh, click, on, click on that with your QR code and then just turn your phone around. You can have a look at these spaces in, in VR um, without uh, having the, the Oculus Rift, um, which is what the other users were, were using. So I'll, I'll stop there. And thanks very much for, for listening. Thank you very much, Edward. It was a uh, very, very uh, interesting, uh, real true use case. So, I, as I understand, you 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 made this project with a client that is very uh, aware of uh, agility. Mm -hmm. so it helped a lot. <laughs> uh, did you try to to make the, the same uh, approach with the other client? Or did you propose uh, them to have this approach now? Uh, well, we've kind of we've since the project has finished, um, we've we've I have to say we've had difficulty in in getting other clients to take it on. I mean, I think I don't COVID's not helped. Um, myself and John, we've we have kind of had a had a go at pitching it to other clients. Uh, inevitably, the ones that we had did go to see. They were kind of thinking that well, they were a little bit far advanced. Um, this is this is difficult stuff for clients. It's difficult for them to to kind of see that it's something that they would want to uh, allow their people at the bottom of their organisations to determine um, what's going to happen in this new building. Um, we're we're meeting all of the same problems that um, Ken and Jeff met when they started Agile at first. Uh, moving into the tech industry, um, it's it's it took them a while, and so we will need some we will need some projects that are properly paid projects uh, that go out there and people actually see the difference. But we but we know we had we had the same response on all three projects. The first project was was a church community, and uh, the second project was my own office at Collider. Um, and we had exactly the same responses from all three cohorts of clients. They all loved it. They all thought it was great. Um, but trying to do that and trying to convince other clients to do it has been really difficult so far. But having said that, I'm, I'm encouraged because um, I think the UK government is moving in the right direction. Um, I think through soft landings, and we're, we're, in, we're in conversation now with the Department of Education, um, you know, with a view to doing a pilot, uh, they seem interested in doing a pilot of it. Um, so I, I'm hopeful that maybe this time next year, when we get through COVID as well, and I think COVID has actually, in some senses, um, put the spotlight back on it again. So, um, so there's 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 still opportunity, and we're we're 
you know, I'm we're going to we're going to keep keep pushing on. Uh, I think it's absolutely essential that the construction industry changes how it does things, and it needs to change just as other industries have changed. To That's why we are here. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Okay, we have a few questions in the comments. So, uh, Andrea asked, uh, did you have also a agile contract in place with the clients? Or did you think about uh, changing your contract to, uh, to integrate this uh, agile approach? Well, in this particular case, um, we're doing a, effectively, we've got a grant uh, from um, the government to, uh, to do these three projects. Uh, so, if it, so these the clients did not have to pay anything. Um, the but having said that, uh, Hippo Digital have actually um, procured the work themselves. So, so the, the design they've actually used that, and they've gone on they've gone on now to instigate that design. Um, Richard tells me that it was virtually finished, just ready for handover, uh, but they had to stop. Um, in March because of COVID restrictions. So uh, nobody's using the office. They've sent everybody to work from home. So um, so the so the project is has stopped. But again, I'm, I'm kind of hoping as well that we can get back in and get some photographs of that when yeah. it's done because I think it will help our marketing situation once we actually see the real office um, and get some really, really nice photographs from it. Um, so I don't know if that answers the uh, So we have another question of uh, Bianca. Who had this idea in the first place? So you, you proposed to your clients? Um, you, well, you... I, think, I think it was kind of a joint decision. Um, I mean, my, my kind of, why kind of, um, we kind of started using Agile um, is, I mean, my background is in building services. Um, I'm, I've kind of been, a practicing building services engineer for well more years than I care to care to mention, um, but as a building services engineer, we tend to uh, get in at the very beginning when clients are given the brief out. We're architects, um, but we're also there at the end, and we're the people who get the phone calls to go back because the air condition is not working or you know, it's not comfortable, it's, the heating's not. So we, we tend to go back and we tend, we tend to see users and we tend to get face to face, you know, with real users. And I've also been doing a lot of research with University of Sheffield. And so a university student on one of my projects uh, went back to look at whether a green building could, uh, could influence the people to be, who are using the building to be green. And we thought this was a great building. And when she came back to me, she said, you know that building that you think is so great? She says, well, your users, they hate it. Over 50% of them think it's absolutely terrible. They wish they could knock it down. And so, so I was kind of thinking, well, how is it that you know, the construction industry can think, you know, we won six awards for that building. Um, we, how, how is it the construction industry can think its, it's, product, it's products are so great? when the users who use them think they're absolutely rubbish, you know, in, in, in many instances. And all of the, all of the research that you could do, um, there's research for 250,000 users, uh, which actually suggests that over 50% of people don't like the building that they work in. So, so it was that in that sense that I kind of looked around to see whether there were other methodologies that we could use that would actually help us to get much more customer-centric buildings. And that's when I came across Agile as a, as a way to do that. And so it was in doing that that, um, that I contacted uh, Hippo Digital uh, to help me to come up with a methodology that would actually help to, um, to instigate this. And uh, I, I, so I, I kind of met them at an Agile uh, session in Leeds. Uh, there were some Agile ses sessions for the tech industry. And so that's when, that's when I kind of, uh, that's kind of when I met them. So, um, so that's why we that's why we kind of decided to uh, to do it, and um, and and it works. It works. It works brilliantly. Uh, and and so we're not. It's fine. It seems now we're not the only one who are doing it. You guys are doing it. There's a lot of there's a lot of people. Yeah, we're trying. We're trying. Yes, yes, doing it as well. Uh, we just need to. We just need to have it uh, much wider. But about um, so I just share. Um, uh, feedbacks tool so for people uh, if they want to, to, to say something 
about this presentation. Uh, so, so about the design, uh, well, uh, how uh, the architect uh, react to 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 this uh, uh, type of approach? Because uh, they used yes to impose their design to users, and so now uh, in this uh, situation they have to 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 uh, listen more to users. So how? Uh, how did they react to that? And did, do you think uh, it, it could work great with the, the architect way of uh, doing projects? Um, well, I mean, John's online at the moment, but I know from talking to him um, that he's kind of um, suggested that um, you, architects, architects can be much braver uh, with their design thinking. Um, things that they might think uh, would be silly or embarrassing um, in, during the design process uh, that might or might not work. They can test them live with the user there and then. So there are, th there, there are things that, um, that architects, you know, it, it actually improves architects' design thinking mm -hmm. and it impro improves the bravery and the innovation in design thinking because you can, you can come up with the most harebrained ideas and test it immediately with a user to see whether they think it's harebrained or a silly idea as well. And if it if it is a silly idea, they will tell you there and then. Um, yeah, we'll so, just, let's have a chat about it, Eddie. Sorry, yeah, I mean, I mean hear me okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> So what's yeah. what's your feelings, John? I mean, John was the, John was the architect that uh, that, that ah, took okay. us through the Thank digital you. process. And where, where yeah. are come on. I think it's, um, I mean, I, I also teach part-time at the university and um, I'm a great believer when, when we get students to do live projects, we always, we always make sure that they do something called co-design, where they do sit alongside users or communities and really start to try and get under the skin of what is really needed. Now, the, the three projects um, that we did, um, I couldn't have foreseen the answers that we actually arrived at. If, if I'd have had a standard commercial brief from, you know, a developer, you're all used to that. You know, I want 10,000 square foot here. They, they, might put, they might want to put a green badge on it. It must be Briam. You know, excellent. Or something. That, that's about as far as you get, you know, and, and, the, and a commercial brief is generally appalling well certainly in this country but this process just takes you into a different world of understanding and collaboration with end users now i'm an absolute firm believer in it i think we the the solutions we arrived at just were a hundred percent added value for the end users including the owners of those companies and in the in the case of the church you know the people who were the sort of governors of the church, I think they appreciated what the end result was. Um, but the, the problem and the reason that Eddie is struggling to push this forward is that that is not the way the construction industry works, it's not the way clients work, um, it's not the way project managers work, it's this control issue. People, people want control and they fight for control and that comes down to you know, uh, an outfit like Hippo Digital were great because we were working with people um, who were interested in agile technologies. And then when they saw the power of the uh, augmented reality, um, you know, and by the way, I actually think, I don't know if you can see me, but I actually think these things, these, these phones will be redundant within about 10 years. I think we'll all actually, the whole of society will be switching to some sort of an augmented reality and that's how we're going to work and so the other thing i'm interested in is what does you know what does post pandemic office space uh, retail space residential space what does it actually look like because the world is going to change and the, the two things that are going to change it are the experience of the pandemic and the the you know the uh, technological advancements that we're seeing you know i mean we all have a mobile phone now 20 years ago me and eddie didn't have one we were out of touch with people most of the time if we were out of the office we couldn't communicate really unless you stopped at a telephone box <laughs> you know i mean the advancement in technology is absolutely massive um 
And this methodology is 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 great. I think in some ways Eddie made, makes it sound a bit strict, and you know we have stages to it. Actually, as an architect, it's one of the most enjoyable experiences you can have because you're placing trust, you're giving people your trust, and you're saying I'm listening, and you really do have to listen. You know, mm-hmm. you can't you, you can't say oh. I, you know, I don't want that. I, I want a lovely glazed curtain wall here. That's no good because somebody wants privacy. You know, you're actually working directly with clients. So, uh, you know, from an architectural point of view, I found it fascinating and, and thoroughly enjoyable. Hmm. I mean, I think I think the I think the important thing here is, and I'm kind of seeing some of the quotes, some of the comments that are coming through. Um, Agile is not a constraint on design or architects in being able to do what they normally do um, what it is is a is a dialogue with more people within that organization who are actually going to use that building um, and so you you kind of get bottom up as well as top down and it's absolutely authentic um, it, it's not second hand and so the information you're getting is right from from the coal phase and and once you've actually got to a solution you can share it infinitely right away across the project and get everything come back. And the methodology allows um, individuals voices to be brought together um, so that there's a, a, almost a heat map the effect that actually happens. So the more voices and, and so there's, it's very democratic. Uh, so more voices who want a certain thing will be heard, you know, before those who effectively these voices are not being carried by by the majority i mean one of the things about the the all our ideas thing was um we used to ask people you know what they think and then and then there's a there's another part of all our ideas which asks the question do other people think the same way that you do and so you give things you give things more more validity if other people think the same way you do so, so it's so agile is very democratic in allowing an organisation to speak in a democratic way to an architect one on one, and then the architect to respond to that, um, which doesn't happen in in the way that we do things now. Um, and if it did, we would actually build things, you know, much faster without risk. We don't we build only what we need to and not any more, um, and we would build things that actually get used. Uh, you know, for the for the you know the absolute amount of use that uh, that is required of them, uh, and no more. So 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 I and so I think you know what we do now is um, uh, it's, it's well it's simply not working. We know the industry is not working, but we do have, we do still have people who think well um, we know we we like we we know what we're doing now and we know how we're doing it, um, and we don't really want to change from that. Um, ultimately the world is changing that they will have to change or else they just won't survive i mean and that's that is simply going to be the case and i think no no more so now in the middle of a a pandemic and we're going on from this we need to speak to our customers and we need to take on board and the people who do will be the ones who survive the people who don't uh, i think won't yeah okay so sorry i was a bit caricatural with the architect but (laughs) now you want to say something yes sapna Oh, oh, sorry. Uh, well, um, yeah, hi. Hi, <laughs> I guess it was just like um, we do a lot of work with, you know, we try to do community participation and co design in that sense. And it is very difficult. And we do try to work to the user, but you, you don't always get that chance. And I think it's always the client's not always clear on what that process means. Mm-hmm it's going to take longer and it's more consuming and actually we couldn't do the co-design they wanted to do in the project we were doing regenerating an area we didn't have a brief the brief had to come from the community but you were never going to get that level of engagement until you address a number of other issues and concerns before they can even engage with understanding what they could have in the future of their area mm-hmm. it was impossible to get to that point and we were expected to put a blank page down and draw a master plan in front of them. That's not realistic either. So no. I think <laughs> it's just a difficult one to get. Well, to. can I can I ask you if you if you kind of use 
any kind of methodology that you in order to engage with users i mean were you were you working just from from gut instinct or or was there was there some sense of uh, coordination of how how ideas would be would be would be well, effectively how you would stir the pot uh, to get the ideas out and then because i mean the other thing is i mean i've been in rooms many many times where you ask you know I'm, i suppose you only have to to lecture students and i mean i've kind of lecture students with john as well and ask them for their ideas and you get mute silence nobody wants to be the one to to actually put their hand up and speak in front of everybody else um they're, they're the kind of they're the kind of, you know, those situations are difficult and so you you kind of end up with users who are uh, good at speaking and not afraid to speak have been the ones the loudest voices who yeah. to carry but mm -hmm. agile gets away from all of that um, yeah. it allows people to put their thoughts down on paper to do exactly. it anonymously and um, in a charrette situation and then to have all of those ideas captured and then uh, assembled into a product backlog and that's the was but maybe the way that that was able to be done was difficult to agree and pull forward i guess but that was what we were trying to do um yeah. so i think it's been useful to see this um on it needs to be developed a bit more yeah you're, break, you're breaking up a little bit here at the same but, but yeah i can't I catch the es essence but you know if you wanted to if you if you feel there's an opportunity to try scrum we'd be yeah. yeah. What what is interesting is uh, we were well, the beam. It's a lot of technology, and, and here we are just uh, talking about how uh, people interact uh, uh, together. So it's not about uh, technology, but we have a question about technology, and and uh, and it was uh, just to add your feedback. Uh, is there any problems? Uh, which type of uh, software did you use? Uh, we used um, Enscape. Um, as our base VR tool, um, we we did have um, some initial issues with um, uh, effectively in the DLA BIM machines um, did not have the graphics hardware to to run a headset. Um, to run a to run a headset, a VR headset, you need to have pretty good refresh rates on the headset which means a hell of a lot of work for a graphics card to actually have to do. So you need, you need, you know, you need to up your spec on your machines in order to be able to run a VR headset. So that was the main difficulty, but once we kind of, um, once we kind of cottoned onto that and we kind of were able to work around it. And, um, and so, so this is why we had Scott, uh, Scott Knowles from Playworks on board. And so Scott was, uh, was, was, was basically our tech guru who, who kind of you, we were managed to to get the Oculus Rift and the the headsets and all of that kind of thing working with the clients you know on board, but all of all of the design was done in BIM, um, uh, so using Revit and uh, then transported from from Revit into um, into Enscape, pretty much click of a button stuff you know at that particular point in time. Um, so it's, um, but there are other, there are other packages out there. I mean, Unity are doing some great things at the minute. Um, so there's, there's there's there are other packages besides um, besides Enscape. Okay. Uh, so uh, another question is: uh, before we, we have um, physical models, so uh, why uh, uh, why we are not were uh, trying this? Kind of approach before with the physical model, and do, and do you think um, uh, new technologies are changing, uh, are, are giving us uh, more possibilities? Well, I mean, it's, I think um, one of the things I mentioned in the uh, in the presentation, um, and I would um, for anybody who's not actually put a VR headset on, um, just just find find an opportunity to do it. Um, we were we were finding that you know we would do things in two D. John would do th to think do do things in two D uh, as a sketch. So using traditional methods that architects would use, and then we would you know pass that over, have it put into BIM or three D in Revit, um, and then we could show um, because when we we're initially um, doing the charrettes where we would uh, have people walking around the building in VR. 
we first of all needed to show them the layout of the plan and we would show it to them in 3D and we would get the feedback from them in 3D. But as soon as they put the headset on, the level of feedback, just like I showed you uh, on that, v, that piece of VT clip, the level of feedback, the minutiae and the granularity of the feedback that was coming back was infinitely more uh, in a VR model than it was with a BIM. And I would suggest it's the same with, you know, people will look at a physical model and say, yeah, okay, that looks great. But there's nothing like being immersed in a VR environment to actually get a real sense of what this space is going to be, what it's going to look like, and how it will feel. Now, we're, we're kind of looking at, um, currently, we're looking at Mozilla Hubs as a platform to place our models. And if, you, if we can place models in, build models and place them into Mozilla Hubs, then we can get you know, up to 25 people to actually enter that model and interact with each other in real time. You know, so they can actually not just walk through the space, but use the space, use it to have meetings, use it to have um, presentations, use it to have, you know, so they can, they can actually experience as if it was the real world, you know, just having a headset on. So that's, the, that's where VR ultimately has possibilities for architectural design. Yeah, the next step is to have meeting uh, directly inside the, the VR model. Yes, so you can you can inhabit the you can have whole teams of people up to twenty twenty five people uh, inhabit the VR, inhabit the VR model together and experience it as if it was real. So people who are at the other end of the room you can't hear them speak. When you move up to them you can hear them speak. So it's that level of um, that's the kind of thing that VR is allowing us to do now. Yeah, uh, because yes. ten years ago there is some uh, application to to meet together in a three D space, but. Uh, uh, we don't use it like that. So, uh, I th do you think now it's mature for for using like that, or it's still uh, what was the the application when you can uh, all the uh, all the big company uh, were invested in that and to to build their uh, virtual uh, market and things like that and uh, mm -hmm. now nobody uh, <laughs> talk about well, that. Well, I mean, where we, you can you can visit Mozilla Hubs now and go in and you know go into a virtual environment with, with half a dozen other people and experience it. You can do that now, but the, res the resolution, uh, excuse me, the, res the resolution of what you're seeing is not that great. Not, not to anything like, you know, an Enscape resolution, um, but it, it won't be long, you know, as soon as we get bigger bandwidths, because they're driving all of this from the cloud. But as soon as we get bigger bandwidths, you know, um, and we get maybe from 5G to 6G, it's absolutely, you can see it's absolutely going to be possible then. But nevertheless, even with the lower resolution, it's still possible to have clients. So technology uh, gives us new possibility to, to interact and... Uh, yes. Uh, yes. So another question, so you, you mentioned you, you work with a Scrum Master. Uh, uh -huh. I know you, you don't mention that you work with a Beam Manager, but probably because the, the project was not so big. But you know, in a more big project, there, there is Big Manager. Do you think Big Manager and Scrum Master are, are things to do together, or could could the Big Manager could evolve to Scrum Master in the future when mm -hmm. a lot more people uh, will uh, um, use uh, more usefully uh, Beam? I don't know. Uh, my my own feeling is Scrum Master is a dedicated. Um, you know, it's a, it's a, it's a, a specialist uh, position. Um, I didn't talk much about the Scrum Master, but Scrum Master's, um, uh, I suppose, job, if you like, is to uh, facilitate the process of Agile happening. So yeah. any obstacles that are in the way to clear the... Uh, yeah, sorry, that's the same for the BIM manager with the BIM process. <laughs> so that's why I'm asking this question. So it, Sorry, I'm, so the, is the BIM manager part of this process? So repeat your question again, Francis. Well, the question is, yes, uh, is there a BIM manager in your process? And do you think in the future the, the BIM manager could evolve to be also a Scrum Master or, or to become a Scrum Master? Well, in, in this particular case, we had, we had, I mean, the project was small, but we didn't have a dedicated, and we, weren't, we, we had no intention to go past you know, the uh, stage two, you know, as it were. 
Um, but that's not to say that the project couldn't be set up to BIM principles. Um, you know, as we're developing the model, that we couldn't begin the process. But we're not, we're not necessarily interested in the level of detail that maybe you would want to start putting into a BIM model, you know, straight away. Um, but you know, we we kind of just really need all of the visual things at some sort of you know visual resolution. Um, but we don't necessarily need to have it as, you know, you know, detail in skirtings or architraves or all of that kind of stuff, you know, very, very early on. Um, but we probably, you probably might want to start to think about, you know, what the, what the BIM process was like to be so that you didn't, you didn't have to, you know, um, so that you could use the model that you kind of developed with the client as, and continue it into, you know, stage three, stage four, and and uh, and beyond. Um, but I don't, I don't think a BIM manager, um, a BIM manager could be a scrum man, a scrum master. But uh, but I would think that it would be better to keep the two uh, separate. Uh, that the two the two functions should always be separate. I, can, I is agree with you in the comments. Yeah. BIM yeah, I, th I think I think so. I mean, that's. Um, you know, Scrum Master is a very specialist, um, you know, role. And, and I, in an ideal world, I mean, I, I felt I knew enough about BIM and Agile to do it. But having said that, uh, when I got Richard involved, um, his, his expertise was certainly of huge, huge benefit to the project in really being able to um, just understand the process look at it from outside see what's happening and make the interventions that actually made this made the process that much smoother um so it's um it's it's it is a, it's you you kind of need to have a mindset for it i think as well um but that's not to say that i mean architects i would say architects could be trained to be bin managers or sorry it could be trained to be scrum managers all architects can be but in fact richard richard powell was an architect um, he used to work as an architect. Um, as a, as a, um, he's an agile coach now, but he, he's tr his former training was as an architect. Okay, uh, Christina, I have a question. But do, do you want to to ask the question by yourself? Or? Hi. <laughs> Sorry, it's a bit long. Hi, Christina. Uh, so I, uh, hello, Edward. Thank you so much for this talk. It's really interesting, mind blowing for me personally. Uh, I just put some context, so I'm an architect and I just, uh, I did a, um, sorry, it's maybe not interesting for everyone, but I'm a UX UI designer, so I'm familiar a bit with the uh, design methodologies and prototyping and just wondering about like the second part. Um, I was wondering more about the prototype, like how many you actually conducted and how, I think Francois at some point asked the question about like, if you had um, a guide with the, like when the people had the, the users had the VR on, did you ask them questions or lead them? And the first part is just for you. It's okay, I won't read it. Uh, well, I, th I think um, I think the if you're asking how many how many kind of um, scrums we did, is that kind of what you're kind of thinking yeah, about? Sorry, the model. I, I meant when you prototype like the three D models you built and uh -huh. that you tested out with the EVR, VR. Like, yeah. did you reiterate on the three D model yes. you showed the users? Yes, yes, we did. Yes, we did. Um, okay. So we so once once they kind of been and experienced it once and been through it mm -hmm. once, um, we just wanted to reflect it back to make sure that they kind of it had everything in that they kind of were expecting it to have, uh, and then you saw the lady who was pointing out that the because at, at, at that the, we had a breakfast bar in the kitchen which had got high stools, and um, and we can't I mean you know the the architects were thinking. That was create a little bit more space, you know, between where the breakfast bar was and where the um, the next part of the drop-in spaces were. Um, but she was kind of thinking, it's it's kind of it's okay, but it's not very sociable. We'd much rather have a table where we can sit with low seating and put food on the table and sit, you know, opposite each other and talk in a in much more community kind of fashion. Um, so that kind of created some spatial problems <clears throat> that were architectural that needed to be solved. 
So John and his team went back and literally solved that as a particular problem and then came back, you know, the next day with the VR model. And then they were able to experience what it would be like to sit at a table, you know, in that particular location. And, um, and so from their perspective, that was a resolution. So you can imagine that that's, um, if we'd have been just, you know, done the traditional way, we'd have left the breakfast bar and thought that was absolutely perfect. <coughs> But they would have been really disappointed and that would have been very very critical point to them to have missed you know so they would have they would have dealt with it you know no doubt maybe maybe knock the breakfast bar out and put their own table in later but um <clears throat> but nevertheless it was something that so they got perfection first time and they will have got perfection for them you know first time so that's kind of um that's so we did we did kind of uh, iterate on the model so sorry i forgot the second part of your question <laughs> yeah <laughs> they're always pre-folded i'm sorry uh no that's very clear thank you i was wondering if you guided them if you had questions or you just let oh, them well. like flow through the space on their own yes um well we read i mean john and his team kind of used the three the 3d model visualization first to show them pretty much where everything was and how it was all set mm -hmm. out but I guess it was kind of a small space anyway, so they got a quite a good impression of that. Um, but you might have seen Scott sitting down at the table, and he was actually when they were going wrong, so because they were not really because they, they were having to use controls to control it. But we had somebody with a keyboard who was kind of, you know, keeping them on the straight and narrow. Um, but that guy in the center, that guy in the center, he was he was really used to you know the the, the toggles. And he he didn't need any help at all, but most of the, most of the other people did need some help um, with uh, with navigating and being able to to get around the place. So what we did we did have someone who could do that for them. Okay. Okay. okay I don't know if there is other question. You can open your mic and uh, ask a question directly. Now we are less people. No no more question. <laughs> was very clear. Okay, Sebastian? Yes, uh, Francois, very interesting. Okay, so uh, we will thank you a lot, uh, Edward. Uh, I just share again the, the Rusty Express uh, tool so you can share your, your feedback uh, with this presentation and we will share it with uh, Edward. Uh, thank you very much. It was very interesting to us to this uh, very clear use case, a real use case, because yes, we, we are all thinking about how to to make agile in uh, our construction industry, but it's not uh, so uh, so easy. You will find some uh, other uh, case or try uh, in uh, the agilebeam.org website. So uh, thank you very much, everybody. So we are very happy uh, because we are more than uh, 100 people. So it was the first time. Thank you Good very stuff. much, everybody. Thank you, Edward, uh, also. And uh, so we will have another meetup in uh, one uh, month about uh, more about uh, architect, uh, architect and how we can uh, interact with engineer to be uh, more agile. So it could be interesting also. So thank you very much, everybody, and uh, we hope we, we will be uh, uh, next uh, with us uh, to the next meetup. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thanks. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.